There are many ways to suffer. You know what we know to be true when we're suffering? We know the pain is unbearable. We know the pain feels like it's not going to end. And we know that there's no escape. We can feel lost when this occurs. And we can reach out to the people we love and who love us. And they'll listen for a little while. But there comes a point where our pain and suffering is too much for them. And what they do is they try to make it go away. They give very well-intentioned advice that just doesn't work. And all that does is make us feel more lost and more alone. There are also many reasons that we suffer. And as philosophers have struggled with this, one of the truths that's come out is that pain and suffering are inevitable. If we live long enough, we will experience pain and suffering. Now, when that inevitably occurs, there's a hard truth we have to face. That hard truth boils down to the circumstances leading up to this may or may not be your fault, but it sure as heck is your problem now. When that happens, there's a second hard truth. This has occurred by definition without our permission and without our vote. And we have no choice in the matter except how we choose to deal with it, what we do. Now, in my role as a rehab psychologist, helping people face chronic health conditions, people have shared their suffering with me, and I've learned that the Buddhists really had it correct. There are people who handle suffering well, and there are people who handle suffering unskillfully. When I think about the people who do handle it skillfully, it turns out that what they have in common is they all follow a pattern. And that pattern is very, very close to what Shane Lopez calls hope. Turns out they have three things in common. The first thing that they do is they're very, very clear on what they want and why they want it. When they're clear about what they want, it can be global. I would like to not feel this pain anymore. Or it can be specific. You know, for a half an hour today, I would like to remember what it's like to not feel pain. The other half of that first part is they have to know why they want it. The reason they have to know why is because that's what's motivating them. That's what will help them through dark days. So the first thing is what and why. Second thing these people have in common that they taught me is they have a very specific how. How are they going to take what they want and make it real? How are they going to incorporate it into their lives? It also turns out that you have to have not only one how, but a backup plan. Because when you have a backup plan, you have something you could do when the first plan inevitably doesn't work. So the what and the why and the how. The third thing they have is they have a belief and a confidence that I can pull this off, which will also help them during the dark days. Now, what I realized is that when people have all three things, the what and the why, the how, and the belief and the confidence, they have what I realized is a master plan. They have a map. And when you have a map, it's hard to get lost. So let me give you two examples. First one, we became friendly with an older couple in the neighborhood who were wonderful. Late 80s, been married forever to each other. And it, they acted and looked at least 25 years younger. They were always out dancing. He was always playing tennis. They were always going to clubs and meetings all the time. And she's a great cook, by the way. Right? So one day, he shares with us, he's not feeling so well, which is very unusual. He was extremely proud that he had great genetics, he was always healthy, and he never had to take 
any of those frou-frou San Francisco supplements. He never had to ever eat kelp in his whole life, and he thought that was great. But he wasn't feeling well. He reluctantly went to see a physician. What the physician found is that he had some arthritis, and that wasn't a big deal. The physician also told him that his kidneys are failing. So they said, let's try some conservative interventions first. And they put him on some medications, some lifestyle modifications. Had to think about what he was eating, which he wasn't thrilled about, but he'll do it. Didn't work. Goes back to the physician. Turns out he has to be on dialysis. He investigated it and decided he doesn't want to be on dialysis. What he wants is to be his old self. He wants his old self back. He does not want to think about being sick. He does not want to think about what he needs to be healthy. He wants to just be healthy. And being on dialysis would remind him he's sick and he doesn't want to do it. Gathered his family and said, look, I don't want to die, but I don't want to be on dialysis, so I'm not going. He's very stubborn. Family, friends tried to talk him out of it, and he wouldn't budge. Now, over time, he felt a lot worse. He felt so bad that he said, <laughs> maybe dialysis is better than this. So he went on dialysis. He predictably hated it. What he hated most is that he had to give up what he wanted. What he wanted was to be his old self, and he had to give it up. And he was very sad about that, and he was suffering. He would talk in a lot of pain about how much he missed his old life. What he did is he put in a new what. So he, he turned to me and he said, hey, Barry, do you know about the internet? He said, there's an internet. You know what's on the internet? Science magazine. Who knew? And he said, I always wanted to learn science my whole life. I was too busy. So it's like, did you hear about nanotechnology? Nanotechnology is going to change the way people live, and they're going to put little robots in you, and he would be passionate about off and running, and his suffering was mitigated because he changed up his what and his why. Let me give you a second example. There's an artist who in the mid-'80s was in her late 50s, came down with stage 4 breast cancer. Good news is that chemo and radiation worked. She was able to live, and for the next 10 years, she had the side effects that you know about from chemo and radiation, which made life hard, but it was okay. The 10th year, she started to get regular metastases. It started to spread. She had three brain tumors. She had seven other metastases taken care of by chemo and radiation. She had a seizure disorder, Parkinson's, and had a stroke. And yet she kept going. So I asked her once, I said, I'm trying to learn about suffering. How are you able to keep going? And she was very forthcoming in her answer. She said, you know, I'm of the generation where when cancer came back, it meant you were dying and you were going to be dead. And I freaked out. And then I realized, wait a minute, it's not a profound revelation to know you're going to die. Everybody who's alive is going to die. I have no choice about that. What I do have a choice of is what I want to do between now and then. How do I want to live my life? She talked about women in her metastatic cancer group. She said, you know, a lot of them are not appreciating life. They're living dying. Every little pain, every little weakness is, oh my God, I'm dying, and they can't appreciate what they have. She said, I don't want to live dying. I want to die living. So she didn't change up her what. She always was an artist. She still wanted to be an artist. She changed up her how. She said, I can no longer paint the way I want, but I can still be an artist. So she would go to galleries. She would go to studios. She would speak to artists in a language that only artists can share and appreciate. She was still a member of that community. When she would go on walks, she'd, I would walk with her, and she would point out colors I've never seen, textures, plants I've never seen, and I've lived here for 30 years. 
She's an artist. She changed up her how. And her suffering was mitigated. Now, you don't have to be facing death in order to suffer. All of us have had heartache, heartbreak, the loss of a friend, the loss of a job, the loss of a home, the loss of a prized possession that meant everything to us. Living in Florida, hurricanes will do that to you. But you can always have a map. The map will help you not get lost, what you want and why, how you're going to make it happen, and belief. When you have all three, you've got a master plan, a map, and that will mitigate your suffering. That's also an idea worth sharing. Thank you.